What I jumped to in acute COVID and in long COVID right away is microclotting and wanting to prevent um, kind of these small thrombosis um, from occurring. And so I would reach for aspirin. Um, so, you know, Jen, you and I have talked a lot about aspirin, have learned a lot about aspirin. Um, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about what type of aspirin um, and kind of what, what we think is appropriate. Yeah, so I personally would do baby aspirin. Now, if you know about like, let's say your platelet counts tend to run high, then you might need baby aspirin twice a day, um, really, because you produce about 10% of your total platelets in a day. But if you're making extra platelets, i.e. your counts are higher at baseline, you're probably making more like 20, 30% of your total platelets a day. And so you really need to, aspirin doesn't last that long in your system. So it only inhibits the platelets that are there in your blood while the drug's around. And then once the drug's gone, all the new platelets you make through the rest of the day are not inhibited. So someone with higher platelet counts, you'd need to take it twice a day. Someone with normal platelet counts, um, if, the, if they haven't really ever flagged high on a complete blood count, CBC, um, then you're, you're fine just once a day. Um, I believe there was also mortality um, benefit data. It wasn't like super strong, but I believe that people on aspirin generally had a, in, um, improved mortality from acute COVID as well. Um, we do know that most viruses will activate platelets to some degree. That's just kind of a natural feature of like platelets have different receptors on them that can bind to various different particles from infectious things. Um, and so it can activate them. And when they're activated, you know, it's, it's easier to clot your blood. And that's definitely been something that's shown in COVID in particular is that um, people get hyperviscous, uh, meaning their blood gets really thick. That's been shown in studies, um, much higher rate of blood clots acutely. And there's also this like delayed risk of blood clots, like your increase, your blood clot risk um, is elevated for as much as like a year. And then if you get reinfected, the risk increase stacks each time you get another infection. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, Ziad Al Ali's group um, has put out amazing research on this. Um, huge, huge, huge numbers of people studied. The, the charts were, I think it's like something close to north of like 10 million charts reviewed for this. Um, so I would personally take baby aspirin and you know, usually when any, they always tell you if you're having like any kind of heart attack type symptoms, you always chew the aspirin because it kicks in quicker, you absorb it faster. Personally, I would use chewable or sublingual. Um, there's some thought that, particularly in women, that women might not absorb aspirin the same way as guys do, that it might be absorbed more so in the stomach. So if you take like an enteric coated one, it may not either fully absorb or it might absorb much later, like further down your GI tract. Um, so for guys, you're probably fine just taking regular old aspirin or enteric coated is probably okay. For women, I'd probably aim more towards just regular aspirin, not enteric coated or like a chewable, uh, just to make sure you're really getting it in there every day. And it's not sort of slow trickling in and not doing the full job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, you know, obviously I, uh, part of treatment for long COVID, one of the proposed treatments is triple therapy. So using aspirin and amongst other things to, to treat this. And so I have experience, you know, treating with aspirin. Aspirin can be a tricky medicine. And so some people will have a bit of stomach upset. So going to a chewable can be a bit, bit tough for people. Um, and so try to take it with food. Um, if you cannot tolerate it, um, I would say probably go to the enteric coated, um, if you're unable to, like, I think at, at least it's, it's something rather than nothing, um, in terms of aspirin. And from the studies I looked at, it looks like enteric coated between men and women, it did get absorbed eventually. Like the, the total amount that made it into your system towards the end, like was the same. Um, at mm -hmm. least in one of the studies they found. So if you can't tolerate it, if you got stomach ulcer history and stuff like that, or you have a bleeding predisposition, then you might, aspirin might not be a good idea for you. Like if you bleed already, if you're on blood thinners, that's something where you mm -hmm. not have to, um, or if you have an aspirin allergy, definitely this is when you want to run by a practitioner before you start it. Um, the other thing is sometimes patients with like mast cell activation, they can react kind of strongly or almost inversely to aspirin. So um, usually if I 
it can benefit people with MCAS, but it can also make them worse. So generally speaking, it's kind of good to know if you tolerate aspirin before you get COVID. So it's something to like ask your provider about ahead of time, long before you get COVID. And maybe if they're like, yeah, this seems like a safe thing for you to try, but you're not sure if you'll tolerate it due to like MCAS or potential allergy, then try like a very small amount and have Benadryl nearby and stuff um, and see if you tolerate it. And if you do, then you're like, okay, cool. At least I know that I can take aspirin if I get COVID. But if you don't tolerate it, definitely let your provider know so that they can add that to your allergies and intolerances list. And then you'll know, okay, aspirin's not the thing for me if I get if I get COVID. Um, the other thing is age. So aspirin during an acute flu-like illness um, can cause something called Ray syndrome in children and teenagers. So you never want to give aspirin to kids and teens um, if they have an acute flu-like illness. So aspirin for COVID would only be for adults, not for teens and kids. I looked up the dates recently, actually, and so the United States recommends anyone less than 19 fall into that kids and teens category, whereas the United Kingdom uh, recommendations are less than 16. Um, again, I'm not a kid doctor, not a pediatrician, but um, just wanted to make sure that people are hearing that. And you can always ask pediatrician to weigh in on that. Um, and this is the whole thing about being prepared ahead of time is asking these sorts of questions so that you know, so that it's not yeah. like you're having to figure all this out while you're acutely sick and you're like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I, I just want to sleep. It's knowing this ahead of time, having that plan. It's like if you live in a really earthquake prone area or like a tornado prone area, you've got your like plan, your emergency preparedness plan. You may have your emergency preparedness kit that's got some foods and batteries, like maybe a little radio, um, some stuff you can use to get through an emergency. I would have a COVID emergency prep kit. 